Hello and welcome to In the Hyperloop. My name is Blake. Today we're talking with Clive Thompson, who's a journalist that writes about technology and society, and he's currently writing a book, How Programmers Think. He recently wrote a piece for Wired magazine called The Vehicle of the Future Has Two Wheels, Handlebars, and Is a Bike. In this piece, he discussed how old technologies are becoming great with new embedded systems, as well as a little bit about how Hyperloop um, might work with cities. And he's also written a piece for Smithsonian Magazine on the history of pneumatic tubes and Hyperloop. So hi, Clive, and welcome to In the Hyperloop. Thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, good to be here. Good to be here. Well, um, I mentioned briefly in the introduction that you're a freelance author and a journalist. Uh, you mm -hmm. worked for so many publications around the world. Um, and one piece you did recently was for Wired, and it was titled mm -hmm. The Vehicle of the Future Has Two right. Wheels, a Handlebars, and a Bike. That was... was yeah. That's how I, I found you. So, <laughs> um, so Terrific. How, how did you become interested in technology and society and, and journalism? Well, it started when I was a kid. I, I, I'm, I'm uh, almost 50. So I was of the age that sort of learned about computers during the very first ever uh, personal computers of the, of the late 70s and early 1980s. You know, the ones that had like basic and you plug them into your TV. So uh, I thought that was really interesting. I was, I was a fairly nerdy kid. And uh, I had I didn't actually have a computer of my own, um, but uh, I had friends that had them, and the school had them. And so I, in playing around with them and seeing that you could get them to do you know what you wanted them to do, I I, I had the intuition that this was going to become a very uh, big thing in the future. You, you could sort of see immediately uh, all the different things that were possible. Even 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 early on, you could sort of you know friends and I would play around messing around with like chatbots or little databases or little you know um, life simulations like Conway's Game of Life and whatnot. Uh, and and then you know a few years later, I learned about the ability to use a, a modem to dial up uh, other bulletin boards around the world. And so I could see a glimpse of the idea of instantaneous communication. Right. Mm -hmm. So so I so. That was really the beginnings of my interest in, in computers and their effect on on on, on everyday life. Um, I knew I wanted to be a journalist. Uh, so what really happened was that I sort of unified those two interests. Because after I graduated, I, uh, I it was it was actually in the 90s. So it was a perfect time to sort of become, I guess, a full-time technology journalist. Because there there was really an expanding um, an expanding sort of a, a um, need for people that were interested in technology and and, and not sort of you know, turned off by what seemed nerdy to, I think, a lot of boomers. Like, they, they couldn't really, they, they really thought the internet was sort of this weird fad that would go away, um, and that technology was a weird fad that would go away. But, you know, for people people uh, of my area of interest, we could see it was there. So, so that started it off, and I've been, you know, do, doing that for uh, about 20, 25 years now, yeah. That's amazing. And, you, you know, each piece that you write about is so varied and, and different, um, but they all kind of do relate to kind of, the role of just the changing nature of societies and, and technology, yes. and it's it's hard to keep up with all of that too. <laughs> it is, it is. Although, and on, on the yeah. one hand, I mean, what I try and write, I try not to write about um, mm. uh, minute, easy, quick changing questions of which company is sort uh, of yeah. going to win or lose, or whether yeah. this particular you know app is better than the previous one. Yeah. I try and focus on the very, very uh, large shifts. Mm -hmm. in society which are which are which move so slowly that they take decades to lock in place right i mean like my first pieces about uh the effect of um asynchronous textual communication i e., like oh. you know like writing to each other yeah. in text yeah. uh fa at a speed faster than postal mail right yeah, yeah. um you know my i first sort of started thinking about how that changed the the what we're able to talk to each other about Mm -hmm. And the way that we're able to talk to each other. So my first couple pieces of that were probably in like the maybe 98, you know, with instant messaging. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in one sense, like it's taken two decades for that to really slowly inch into the mainstream. And and most of the things I'm trying to write about are, are at that level. Yeah. So in one sense, it's actually not hard to keep up because these things these things are, are, are very slowly unfolding. One of the reasons why I'm interested I've been increasingly turning my mm -hmm. attention in the last 10 years to transportation mm -hmm. is uh, because uh, all of these technologies that um, that took a long time to ripen and uh, and and commercialize to the point where you could apply them to things like cars mm -hmm. and bicycles mm -hmm. um, 
you know, our, uh, our, you know, our, 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 are beginning to fall into place, you know, yeah. like, like it, it, it was, you know, like people thought about self-driving cars, uh, um, you know, in, in the, you know, decades, 1950s. Ago. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and when you go in and I, when I, I visited, uh, the, um, robotics lab at the, uh, at Carnegie Mellon, the national mm. uh, robotics, e, uh, NREC, I forgot what ENC stands for anyway. Uh, and they showed me like the first yeah. self-driving car that they were able to sort of make. And I think it was, I believe it was the late nineties mm. and it had, you know, it moved about an inch a minute, I think, or something like that. Like, or maybe an inch a second might've been in, no, it was like an inch a second, but uh. it was very, very slow because, you know, computers were slow back then. Uh, mm. memory was expensive, uh, mm. sensors. They didn't really have in reasonably inexpensive things like LIDAR. And then over the next 10 or 15 years, what happens is consumer technology, you know, drives the price of all these sensors downwards because we're making all these mobile phones. And uh, it drives the cost of processors downwards because everyone wants to buy computers for games and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, you can begin to start to snap together a self-driving car with stuff that literally, you know, you don't, you don't, you no longer need to innovate on the hardware. That stuff is, is has mm -hmm. been produced by people's desire for fast video games and fast computer chips. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and now, you know, you would have people who are sort of building their own self-driving cars just for fun. You know, yeah. like, like you see, you see, you know, these maker hackers that are like, oh, here's, you know, I, I use Google TensorFlow to, to train like a visual model. And I, and I bought, you know, some cheap LIDAR and here's my self-driving car tooling around the backwoods of Texas or whatever. Um, and, and, and so, so in one sense, one of the reasons why I think I'm writing more about transportation mm -hmm. now is because it took 15 or 20 years for all the technologies to ripen to the point where you could actually start to really, you know, change the nature of mobility um, mm -hmm. on an everyday basis. And I think that's what I picked up in your article because you're, you're saying like, guys, our bicycles now can be equipped with GPS and like, mm -hmm. you know, dockless yeah. and, you know, it, it really opens up kind of a whole new, uh, generation of bicycles and it's, yeah and yeah. It, yeah and yeah yeah, yeah. A, a very old yeah. technology but a ho yeah. one that was um uh, uh and it's weird because bicycles you know were driven off the streets by cars mm -hmm. uh, um yeah. and uh then they sort of began to come back in the 70s and 80s when you get mm -hmm. things like the critical mass movement of people saying no actually we want to cycle on city streets <laughs> and the reason why we can't is because it's unsafe why is it unsafe yeah. because there aren't any bicycles on the streets it's a self it's it's a self perpetuating yeah. cycle so they had to break it by saying we're going to start cycling on the on the streets i moved to new york in 1998 and I brought my bike with me from Toronto, but I didn't, I never rode it because it, it, I, I could intuit that because there weren't enough cycles on the streets, it wasn't yeah. very safe here. Yeah. So I gave it away. Yeah. And then I did not ride uh, a bike until about 2011 mm -hmm. when I finally decided that after in, in the, in the sort of 13 years in that period, there was enough cycles in the streets now that they had achieved critical mass. Mm -hmm. Motorists were sort of looking out for you. Mm -hmm. And then lo and behold, in that exact same time, again, you have, you know, inexpensive GPS chips that have emerged, uh, inexpensive solar panels, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and ubiquitous Wi-Fi, right. Yep. And, and, and sort of inexpensive cell phone guts. And community. So you, now you have all the things that allow you to build, uh, something that you couldn't have built until about 2012, which mm -hmm. is a not that expensive docking station for uh, for uh, um, a bike share technology. And then you, because, then you, you know, get the city bikes. <laughs> you get city bikes, right. Exactly. Yeah. You get city bikes. Yeah. And so they needed to have, you know, mobile phone technology because people needed to know, is there, I'm walking up to the stand, are there going to be any bikes there? Yeah. Nobody's going to use that unless they can figure it out. Well, you couldn't figure that out until you had a mobile phone. You have to have a way of knowing where the heck the, the bicycle is. So you have yeah. to have GPS in it, which means you need cell phone towers, which means you need, you know, uh, um, you know, GPS satellites. So all these things sort of snap together and completely transform the way we can deploy bicycles mm -hmm. uh, and this is what this is what to me is, is incredibly interesting is, is how these very very basic consumer technologies sort of you know uh, uh, um, catalyze this transformation of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of a very old technology yeah it's and it's um, it this uh, transformation of technology is affecting the cities and now it's kind of affecting rural areas and mm -hmm. um, and you know the with the e-bike invention, you know, you can really travel great distances on oh, a bicycle. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, after I wrote that column, oh, yeah. two things happened. One is that in the column I said, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think this, you know, bike rental and, 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 and whatnot model and dockless 
bike model. Dock, mm -hmm. let's to be clear for people who are listening in, means that, that there's no docking station for the bikes. You just literally, when you're done with it, you lean it against the wall somewhere, uh, hopefully unobtrusive, hopefully not in a huge pile <laughs> the way it's happened in China. Yeah. Uh, um, and, uh, and the next person, and it self-locks, next person who wants it, looks on their phone, figures out where it is, mm -hmm. comes around and gets it. And the advantage there is now the bicycles can kind of go where where I suppose where demand is basically, as opposed to being where the stands are. It also means, and this is something interesting that I discovered talking to folks, the bicycles can go to neighborhoods that are less well off basically. I mean, mm -hmm. cause right now a lot of those, a lot of the stands are, are in well off gentrified neighborhoods. Um, mm -hmm. and they're not, uh, uh, nobody wants to put a spend to put a fifty thousand dollar stand, or nobody the, yeah. the companies doing it don't want to put it in a in a low income neighborhood because they're yeah. worried people aren't going to use it. Lo and behold, when the bicycles are dockless, a lot of them wind up in low income neighborhoods because people find this is actually an incredibly convenient thing to do because the bikes are like a dollar, you know, an hour. They're pretty cheap. That's so so, cheap. Um, yeah. so it, it's so it's it, it's it shakes up. It really opens up the market to, to underserved mm -hmm. areas too. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the point being, I wrote, I wrote this piece and two things happened that mm -hmm. I didn't expect. Um, one was that I got emails from people in a lot of rural areas uh, oh, really? uh, or, or smaller towns saying, actually, we, we, we lobbied and made our own little bike share thing out here. Oh, uh, nice. And it's been great. Yeah. Like, oh. you know, literally like maybe only 30 bikes, but yeah. they, but they put it together and they got, and they, and they got funding for it and they love it. And it's like these smaller towns of maybe just a couple thousand people. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they've been a huge hit. Yeah. So I didn't expect oh. that. Uh, oh. And the e-bike thing, I started getting all these emails from e-bike manufacturers who are making these bikes now that can carry like a hundred pounds of additional cargo on top of you and go for like a hundred miles on a single charge. What? So like, like, <laughs> it's, 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 it's nuts. I mean, they're, 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 they're like, it's like, like, cause you know, one of the things that, you know, I said was, you know, this is probably only a thing for cities. And they're like, no, no, you could actually, you know, you could go a significant distance with a big load. And That's crazy. again, I'm, I'm not, you know, huh. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve judgment to see how popular something like that could get. But the point is it's not technologically impossible. Whether there's a mm -hmm. demand for it is a whole different thing. But, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's, it's interesting what's newly possible with bicycles now. That's, that's really amazing. I, um, you know, it's, it's changing so rapidly. I didn't even know about small towns, you know, wanting bike share yeah, programs. But that makes exact sense. Um, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I mean, like, I think there's, there's really a strong sort of coastal or large city um, uh, assumption that this is a bikes are for them because it's hard to get around. But, um, but and, and there's also more, the other thing that someone pointed out to me is a lot of, a lot of towns are trying to, a lot of smaller towns in rural areas are trying to kind of densify, which is when they build mm. new, when they build new, when someone comes along and says, I'm going to build 30 new buildings, they want to build it clustered together close to the downtown core as mm -hmm. opposed to sprawling in the middle of nowhere because they, yeah. they already, like a lot of the millennials are going to buy these houses, want to be able to walk to the downtown core where there's a bar yeah. or, there's a, or there's a restaurant. Yeah. And so, yeah, bike share, that's, you know, sort of fits perfect. in there. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so going back to kind of your role as a journalist and an author, uh -huh. um, what are some of the, the biggest challenges that you face? Um, mm -hmm that you might encounter? Yeah. Well, I'd say one of the, uh, uh, one of the big ones, um, is, uh, uh, keeping on top of what's going on. I mean, mm -hmm. as much as I said, things change slowly. Um, that's true, but there's also a lot of developments, right? So, you know, one of the things that I, I write about a lot now, um, in addition to transportation is, mm -hmm. um, uh, machine learning, you know, uh, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence is, is a big area that, um, is becoming, common because you're now seeing it plugged into almost everything, you know, toasters, yeah. you know, cars, certainly, you know, um, and, uh, and, and there's really a lot to know in a, in a complicated field like that. So yeah. often what I find is a new field will come along and, mm -hmm. you know, 25 years ago, that would have been the internet. And then like, you know, like eight, eight or nine years ago or 10 years ago, it would have been, what are the, what, what are the sociological and anthropological or ethnographic dynamics of social networking? How does mm. that change? What yeah. Back with each other? Yeah. Uh, or, you know, um, now it's uh, Bitcoin or blockchain or now it's Bitcoin. Yeah. Blockchain. Yeah. That's another yeah. one. And so, uh, you know, one of the things I have to do is really get myself up to speed on how this stuff works. Mm -hmm. Um, and that can necessitate, you know, months or months or really, I mean, sort of it, it, it's measured over years. I'll sort of, something mm -hmm. will come on my radar and I'll see it happening. I'll learn a little bit about it. And then as it becomes more and more mainstream, I'll have to accelerate the speed at which I learn about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and if it's a technologically 
complex sort of area like machine learning or blockchain that can involve like mm -hmm. really just reading a ton of white papers and talking to a ton of experts mm -hmm. to try and wrap my my mind around how it actually works you know mm -hmm. and what are what are its strengths what are its weaknesses what do we know about how it works what do we not know and what are what are liable to be the unexpected yeah. implications of, of of how it's deployed yeah. um that's one of the that's i suppose that it's one of the biggest challenges i, I spend i don't really spend a lot of my time writing a very only a tiny mm -hmm. tiny fraction of my mm -hmm. year is is sitting down writing at the keyboard most mm -hmm. of it is um is research mm -hmm. most of it's talking mm -hmm. to people and sitting around reading uh, um oh, like you know, like 90, you know, 95 plus percent of my time is, is, is research. That's, that's I write, really write, write infrequently. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so we have on, you know, the challenge of just, you know, research, research, research. But what do you what do you like to do, you know, in the technology and journalism community or mm -hmm. what do you like about this or in your role? What I like about it is that is that. Um, I mean, one of the, I mean, the same thing I liked about when I was a kid, I could immediately, uh, the, the thing I like about technology uh, and science as kind of um, subjects to write about is that they, 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 their effects are felt everywhere. So mm -hmm. um, certainly transportation, like we've been talking about, uh, certainly, you know, social networking, you know, like we've been talking about, but, you know, you could sort of report on any field you want. And there's mm -hmm. something there, you know, whether mm -hmm. so is whether it's you know agriculture and farming, whether it's healthcare, whether it's culture and music. Um, I'm I'm a musician and oh, yeah. um, and I pay a lot of attention to the ways in which um, uh, technology has changed the way that you can actually make music. And that that could mm -hmm. be as obvious as you know, wow, you know, music's online, uh, but it could just be you know like the fact that you know guitar pedals are now software defined right huh. so you can you can, yeah. so you can you can get these there's this open source pedal uh made on the arduino board where you can you can um uh instead of having to like wire a bunch of diodes together to get a certain type of fuzz tone uh what you're doing is is writing software that manipulates the sound of the guitar so oh that you goodness. can emulate a fuzz tone That's and neat. so i've been playing around with things like that you know because uh, i like the idea i've been trying to think of like what if you know, if if you can software define the way uh, an effect works, you can you can do really fun things that that are that are that are harder to do with circuitry. Like you can you could change the modulation or the amplification in response to the to the to the way you're playing and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So 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 if that's just a little example, right? There's like so music. You know, you you can pick any area of sports. Uh, um, a friend of mine. Um, Mark McCluskey, a wonderful writer, uh, mm -hmm. did an entire book just about the way technology was changing the way that athletes train. Um, yeah. And yeah. Uh, uh, so you, you could, you know, the thing about this beat is you can you can go anywhere you want with it. And yeah. I think I think that's what's a lot of fun about it. I, I totally agree. So, you know, let's switch gears a little bit and close out with some um, even more fun sure. questions. Uh, yeah. What is, what is your favorite city for transportation? Um, that oh you've encountered yeah. or bits of aspects yep, of city. Yep, yep, yep. Um, I mean, I would say uh, cities that have done transportation really well. I've been in a bunch of European cities that have impressed me. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I was in Berlin and I thought their public transportation was oh, terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, I think German overall transportation is great. Like I, I've, I've only been in a couple cities, mm -hmm. and, but I have crisscrossed the city on the rail and I've just, I'm generally super impressed with German transportation. I think they've done mm -hmm. a great job. Um, I have never been on, and I've wanted to be on a bullet train. I've oh. been in China a bunch of times, but I've the, the for whatever reasons the places I was going, it made more sense to fly. And mm -hmm. I and I'm 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 kind of uh, uh, one of these days I have to get back there because I really want to try bullet trains because I think they're in, just an incredibly interesting and amazing uh, um, technology that I wish the heck we had here in North America. Right? I you know, could you totally imagine? Agree. Could you imagine what 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 um, the economy would look like on the coast or in parts of the totally. central parts of the country if we could bullet train around? I mean, it's it's sort of it, it really it's you know America has so much dynamism already in its economy, um, but in one sense it's actually hampered by this incredibly old corroded transportation system that yeah. is not up uh, for the for the movement of goods. And you know we look at the we look at the economic sort of um, problems facing a lot of rural and exurban areas, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, they half of them that don't even have like good good broadband. I mean, I'm yeah. like, you know, first we need to just roll out some damn good broadband to all these oh, rural yeah. areas, mm -hmm. but then we need to hook them the heck up with like a really good speedy transportation. It would be it, it would be epic. So yeah. so those are some cities. I mean, I actually I, I'm from Toronto, and I think yeah. Toronto ha has an okay uh, transportation system. Uh, um, Definitely, uh, and definitely. There, it's, yeah, there's what, so many. There's so many different types of transportation in yes. Toronto too. You have yep. trams, you have, you yep. know, yep. trains, you have buses, everything. Yeah. 
Uh, and interestingly, there, there's there's uh, um, there's been a movement on and off over the years to try and um, resuscitate. Toronto is really interesting because back in the 20s and mm. whatnot, it laid out a um, uh, uh, five railways, surface railways that all uh -huh. fan out. And that all meet down at the center core and go at like yep. fingers on a hand, yeah. and they're they haven't been used since like huh. the 30s or 40s basically. And people are like, why are we building subways? We could just we could literally just clean up those tracks and run trains out to the to the exurbs with that, you know. And wow. and the trains are, the tracks are already there, like. Wow. And but of course, you know, politicians love big grand projects, so they've been trying to dig new subway tunnels. Where you know, for literally the price of half of a subway tunnel, oh, man. you get all those surface routes just you know you know with trains going back and forth like mad filled with people so oh. I, there's there's more there's a lot of vision that i would like to see one thing that i've been keeping my eye on mm -hmm. uh is i've seen this in a few cities which impresses me and i'd love to see it more mm -hmm. is um sort of right-of-way signaling with surface route buses right so the bus shows mm -hmm. up at a at a at a intersection and the lights automatically change to let it through oh, right oh that's so amazing. buses become the fastest thing you can possibly be on, you know? And yeah. and it's it's great. I mean, like, it makes total sense. You know, there's totally that is. bus has 40 people on it. Just let it go through the damn light, you yeah. know? Yeah. And, um, and again, that's something that would have been really hard to do 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. now you can do that with sensors that literally cost a oh, yeah. dollar a piece that, yeah. that were designed for drones and mobile phones. So so to me, like transportation is, is simply one of the most interesting stories right now. And um, mm -hmm. and and the innovation is really happening in um, in in smart towns and cities around the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, final question. Um, this one's I've, I've asked, started asking this to a whole bunch of uh, SpaceX Hyperloop pod competition teams and, yeah. and companies. Um, you know, if you could ask Elon Musk any question, <laughs> Hyperloop related or not, you know. What sure. Would it be? <laughs> oh boy. Uh, um, oh boy. Trying to think, what what would be a good question to ask him? Um, uh, uh, Some people have asked him out for a beer. <laughs> you know, the, yeah, the sure. Irish hyperloop. Uh, 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 I mean, I mean, I, I mean, in a weird way, I guess I might because I studied literature. Oh, uh, yeah. um, uh, I, I might ask him what his um, what his favorite. Uh, work or works of fiction are oh. because um you know i've discovered from talking to a lot of people in technology have been inspired by all sorts of things there's a lot mm -hmm. of science fiction as you'd imagine mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh, um and uh, and and you know fiction is how we architect um our vision of what the future should be it's it mm -hmm. it, it northup fry would have said it it educates your imagination it trains your imagination mm -hmm. so it and so you know what the what, whatever you can say about elon musk he does not lack for vision right so mm -hmm. um i'd be sort of interested to know whether or not you know when he was a kid when he was a teenager right now yeah. whether there's any kind of works of fiction that have um uh, catalyze his imagination. That's what I'd be interested in. Uh, that's that's a that's a really important question. I think <laughs> that needs yeah, that needs to sure. be asked of, of of most visionaries nowadays. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Ask what ask yeah. what they read. It's, well, it's, it's an interesting question. Totally. Well, thank you, uh, Clive, so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule in your day uh, to join Happy us. To um, for our viewers that want to learn more about you, um, where is the best place for them to go? Or Two places you, you can you can follow me on Twitter, uh, Pomeranian ninety nine, yeah. uh, the little dog Pomeranian with ninety nine at the end, or you can just go to my website clivethompson.net, and that has all the links to everything there. Uh, two best places, uh, and then I've got a new book coming out next year, uh, which is called Hello World, and it's all about the psychology and personality and worldview of computer programmers. Uh, so uh, when that comes out, please pre-order. Uh, the more sales I get in the, on the first day, the more better chance I have of getting on the bestseller list. So, oh, awesome. uh, I'll be I'll be back to bug you when when the book's coming out. Yes, we'll do a post interview from that. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank okay. you so much, Clive. Have a good day. You too. Take care.